So this is the personified representation. So mother nature, father culture, and the individual. Okay, so now imagine that that's sort of your primary, as a primate who's striving towards linguistic representation, that's kind of what you've got to work with. As far as you're concerned, that's the primal structure of the cosmos. So there's you, that's the individual, there's your mother and nature, there's your father and culture, and wherever you are, that's what there is, and that's what you've got to work with to begin with. Okay, now, you know evolution is a conservative process, and so what that means is that it's not a radical renovator. Usually what evolution does is cobble something new onto something old while the old is conserved. So, for example, you have mechanisms way down in your, in your neurological systems that enable you to do things like detect snakes with an incredible rapidity and jump out of the way. Those are reflexes, and same reflexes, similar reflexes that are operative, say, when you put your hand on a hot stove and jerk it away before you even know it's hot. So and the, reason you have, the reason you can do that is because your body has conserved incredibly primitive neurological loops, say, when you jerk your hand away from a stove, that only run from your hand to your spinal cord and back. So they're super fast, but you know, they can't do much. They can jerk your hand away, which, which is enough if it's burning. It's like it's a good thing to have conserved. So human beings, as they evolved cognitively, started out with this social cognitive architecture that, that they interpreted the world through. And you can see why this would be, partly because, well, we do live in, in an intensely social environment. There's always been mothers, there's always been fathers, and then you add to that the human fact that we have this unbelievably long developmental period where we're um, incapable, fundamentally incapable of taking care of ourselves, right? So, you know, when something like a, a moose calf is born, it's like three minutes later, it's wandering around, and if a wolf shows up, it can, you know, it can run beside its mother. It's like a human baby just lays there for like a year, you know. And part of that is because, you may not know this, but for a mammal of our size, we should have a gestation period of two years. So when those of you who are women have children in the future, and, you know, at nine months, you're pretty damn sick of this, you might well thank the structure of the cosmos that you don't have, you know, 15 more months to go, because... That's how long the baby should remain in utero. <coughs> the reason it doesn't is because its head grows too fast, because we have this big brain, and so there's this weird evolutionary arms race between the mother's body and the pelvic girdle and the head size of the infant, and the way that's all sorted itself out is women's hips are still narrow enough so they can run, because if they were any wider, they'd have a hard time running, and the baby is born ni at nine months instead of 24 with the compressible head, because baby's skull bones aren't put together, and so when they pass through the birth canal, their head can be crushed and quite a lot so that, you know, hopefully they live. So, anyways, we have this incredible period of dependency after that. It's abject dependency for the first while, but then you're really not, I don't know how long it takes people to really get up and going. It's like, well, 18, we'll say, but of course that's complete rubbish. It's more like 30. So there's a very long dependency period. And so that's all the more reason why we would tend to view the world as, you know, mother, father, and then expand that out into our conception of the cosmos. And here, here seems to be how people did it. So it's a complicated association to manage, but I think the best way of managing it is to think of the figure of Mother Nature. And that, that would be Mary here, it would be Isis there. Now, nature is a funny thing, because I don't want you to think about nature the way that modern people think about nature. I want you to think about nature as that which lurks outside of culture. So imagine in the typical tribal scene, or let's say in the typical rather primeval uh, village or gathering, there's a domain that people inhabit that, that they're sort of comfortable with, that's where all the people are, that's where the dominance hierarchy is, and then that's sort of surrounded by God only knows what. Like the outside world, the barbarians, the, the darkness that eats the sun when it goes down at night, all the things that are foreign and uncomfortable are outside of that circle, and that's nature. What's outside of culture is nature. And so nature is the unknown, and then what's inside is culture, that's the known. And that actually turns out to be, weirdly enough, even though it's a worldview that's predicated on this underlying social cognitive structure, it turns out to be an, a worldview that's unbelievably useful because it happens to map onto the structure of subjective experience extremely well in that wherever you go, you're viewing the world through a cultural lens and you're usually encapsulated in a culture as well. I mean, 
you virtually, it's virtually impossible now to go anywhere where culture isn't with you and around you. I mean, you can do it from time to time. But even if you manage that, it's still inside you. In, 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 it's, 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 it's coded in the way that you behave, and it's structured the way you perceive things and think about them. So even if the outside world is devoid of cultural artifacts, it doesn't matter because you're a cultural artifact right to your core. Despite that, and, and, and it's the incorporation of the culture that allows you to maneuver and live and act and, and do that somewhat successfully. Despite that, despite that you're enculturated and embedded in culture, nature can pop up and disturb you pretty much at any moment. And that happens when whatever it is that you're doing doesn't work. And so the way that, that humanity naturally perceives the world and symbolizes the world is as a place that's basically composed of culture. And culture is where you are when things are going according to how you want them to go. That's sort of the definition of knowing. Right? It's, it's not knowing a set of facts. It's, it's knowing how to behave so that the ends that you're pursuing get acquired. And that's more important in many ways than knowing facts. Facts may help you do that, but they, they may not too. So there's, there's, there's the place you are when you know what you're doing and you get what you want, and then there's that other place that pops up all the time where you haven't got a clue about what to do. And that's the place that, it's like a transcendent place, and that's nature. And the transcendent place is where all the mysteries of life come from, the things that you cannot handle, the diseases, the illnesses, death, disappointments, frustrations, all the things that knock you for a loop and make you tumble underground. And that's nature, nature like a predator. And it, it's a strange place, nature, because on the one hand, it gives because nature is the source of all things, given that it's the source of all new things. But on the other hand, it takes away because, because it surrounds you and because it transcends your knowledge, it's eventually what, what kills you. So people have a very ambivalent relationship with nature and, and, and with nature because of, its, because of its bifurcated and paradoxical um, existence. Culture is the same way. I mean, in formal logic, a thing can't be one thing and its opposite at the same time. In these mythological categories that are derivatives of social cognition, things are what they are and their opposites at the same time, just as you're a beneficiary and a victim of culture and a beneficiary and a victim of nature. So... Now, the reason, part of the reason I'm telling you this is because it's, it's, it's very complicated to grasp, but what's, what's happened with you neurologically in part is that the part of your brain that, that evolved to deal with things like predators and dangers, you know, things that are emanating from nature that would directly threaten you, once those things became abstracted so that they could handle, became sophisticated enough so that they could handle abstractions, instead of dealing with things like Predator A or Predator B or Predator C or Danger Situation A, they got sophisticated enough to deal with the class of those things. And so human beings, instead of perceiving a dangerous animal or a dangerous place, started to be able to perceive danger as such and to conceptualize danger as a class of events. But the same circuits that, were origina that originated to do things like take care of, you know, to make sure that you knew where the snakes were coming from, are also the circuits that now enable you to conceptualize danger in the abstract and to, you know, to deal with it one way or another. Potential future danger, danger now, the fact of danger as an existential reality, all of that. Only human beings can conceptualize the class of all dangerous things. And part of that's associated with nature.